Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Paul Duncan McGarrity. Welcome to another episode of Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity, and we're doing a question and answer episode, which means that I am joined once again by Laura. Hello. Hello. <laughs> we didn't know how we were going to start that, did we? It's, it's come out much more formally than you'd expect. Hello. Hello. <laughs> That's not how I formally say hello. <laughs> That's not how you formally say <laughs> Like in an interview. <laughs> hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's maybe why I'm not getting hired for as many things as I want. <laughs> Hello! Let's talk about the numbers. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to do a question and answer one. Uh, first things first, obviously, we will get... Uh, well, I was going to say get this out of the way, but this is the bit that I quite enjoy doing, uh, which is saying thank you to everyone who has listened to the episodes this month. Um, particular thank yous to... The uh, one person who downloaded it in Saudi Arabia and the one from Burkina Faso, which is a, cool. a new country <laughs> to have downloaded. Not a new country. I was going to say, not a new country. Not a new country. <laughs> first time I've ever heard of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so new people. And a particular hello to everyone in Miss Allison's class who have been listening along. Um, they've sent in questions previously, and I understand that they're keeping up to date, uh, working on research. I just wanted to say hello to all of you, and thank you very much uh, for listening in. Um, if you want to send questions to us for future episodes, you can get in touch with at AskAnarch on Twitter. That's the best way of doing things. Uh, or you can send in any you know feedback, comments, questions, queries, and the like. Sounds good? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, shall I preface this one by saying that when I asked for the questions this month, I said, is there anything particularly people might have about volunteering? Uh, this is only because, of, uh, well, this is because of a couple of things. One, uh, in my position as a community engagement project officer, uh, I uh, have been working with and alongside volunteers for a while, so it's, it's probably worth getting that bias out before I uh, answer any of the questions. That's uh, It's part of my job, it's part of what I do, I think it's an important part of it. Before, Don't tip my hat before we get into it. <laughs> uh, but I think it's important before I answer these questions that people know that I have a vested interest in it. And it's something that had come up. On Twitter, there'd been uh, there'd been a bit of discussion about the the value of, of volunteering in archaeology, and this month I asked, uh, as well as just the general questions about archaeology, if anyone had any specific questions about volunteering. And Laura, have we had anything about volunteering? We have. We've got loads. Um, so I'll try and work through them. But there's a little bit of overlap between some of them so mm -hmm. hopefully yeah i'll try and make sure i mention everyone who got in touch even if we sort of yeah similar questions come up um but yeah it's really there's some some interesting ones actually <laughs> I, I i don't know what the thread was about on twitter but um no. yeah I, I look forward to hearing all about it um so shall we get going yeah go on then um right so the first one is from andrew ward mm -hmm. and he says, do you feel volunteers are an important part of British archaeology? Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> I feel like I might know the answer to this Yeah, one. <laughs> and that's why it was important for me to put out my particular biases in this one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> um, I think it's incredibly important for a lot of different reasons. Um, some of them which I think we'll touch on more specifically with other questions that have been raised um but i think in this instance i think it's important because uh archaeology by its very nature is an interesting subject matter um when you are studying it you as a professional it's sort of like uh something that you devote your life to you spend a lot of time studying and and uh researching but the thing you can't forget is that 
the history and archaeology you're studying isn't just yours. You can't just like go and hide it away. The communities and and the development of those communities, there's an end. You know, there tends to be an end point to them, and that end point is the community that is around you at the time that you're working. As such, I think there's an importance to involve uh, professionals and non-professionals in the understanding of archaeology for loads of different reasons. It's not just that it's, um, you, it helps you disseminate the information. It helps you uh, have people build ties in their local area with the, the history of it. And so they understand a little bit of, you know, their own shared collective um, histories and developments. But it's... So if I sit and... This is this is one of those things where if I sit and I, I try and understand something about how the past was structured, there will always be certain elements of my own characteristics and experiences that will colour my understanding of the facts uh, or my interpretation of them. Mm-hmm. Understanding the facts is the wrong word. So my interpretation of the facts. Mm-hmm. Um, so my interpretation of the facts will be as a university educated white man from a working class background but now quite middle class. Yeah. Um, and I will probably inadvertently or subconsciously interpret archaeological sites through that filter. Yeah. Now, volunteers do come from, traditionally, a a certain socioeconomic group as well. But it's my responsibility to find a wider wider range of groups to get involved in archaeology to help in the interpretation side of things. So you need more people... Well, the more people you've got, the, yeah. the better lens you've got to view it. Exactly, through. the more people, and so one. But of that the, could be professionals or non-professionals. Yeah, it could be professionals and non-professionals, and that, but that's it. Yeah. Like, but having professionals and non-professionals involved in the process of interpreting a site, the more eyes on something, the more backgrounds that you have, the mm-hmm. more experiences of the world that you have the more um, rich an understanding or potential understanding of an archaeological site can be. Mm -hmm. If everybody went through the same process of reading Renfrew and Ban, the the go-to archaeological book for someone who doesn't want (laughs) to read too deeply but still get a decent Um, (laughs) 2-1, or Hodder or all of those other books, right? If we're just all reading from the same sort of textbooks... You'll all have the same perspective. Yeah. yeah. And we'll all be looking at them potentially from a, a, the top-down... kind, You know, like, whatever our um, theoretical background is, that might be influencing us. But if you've got people who are just coming from having lived in the area, they can just go, oh, no, you know, uh, you don't know about this thing that happened 30 years ago because why would you but we do because we were living here and my granddad was living yeah. here and we got these local so it brings a, a richer like contextual yeah analysis yeah to so it basically as well basically it's more eyes on it uh is a better thing um it's not just the professional's history you can't just go and you know ring fence it off and not tell anyone about it because That would be rude. Um, And there are other factors uh, at play as well, which are uh, to do with staffing levels. Uh, But I think there's other questions that that cover that one a little bit more accurately. There are indeed. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Perhaps I shall move on to those questions then. then. So, uh, Tristan asks... Are professional archaeologists in competition with volunteers? And then it goes on to say, in so much that by upskilling volunteers, employers no longer value archaeology skills due to high supply. Should the job market rely on volunteering experience when that requires you have to have money in the first place? Right. So there's a lot of things in that question. Um, First thing, getting my uh, context in first, I'm going to speak about this in a UK 
context because mm-hmm. that's obviously the one that I know. Um, the thread that I discussed earlier kind of was brought this up. It, I believe it was an American archaeologist who said that any time you bring a volunteer on site, it devalues the um, the archaeologist and says that it keeps wages low and um, a, a volunteer cannot dig a site properly. You destroy the archaeology by having a volunteer do it. Um, okay. Which I would say, she, she basically said volunteers and students shouldn't be allowed on archaeological sites because they'll wreck it and that she herself... Uh, and I, remember, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying only this from second hand, so, yeah. you know. Um, but she said that she, in her education, had had a fake site created in that people had buried certain art, like uh, artifacts, inverted commas. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was how her training dig happened as mm. a student. Okay? So what? So she couldn't mess, mess anything, anything up. up? Now, I went on a training dig when I was a student to Barkham Roman Villa, which was a Roman villa, yeah. right? And we didn't wreck it. We learned how to do it because we were under the supervision of people who were keeping a close eye on us. Yeah. And the site is being recorded well. And not only that, but I don't think I would have had the joy of archaeology <laughs> redigging up something that someone I, mean, I know has buried. I mean, I'm imagining a sandpit that yeah, someone's buried, exactly. like an old spade in or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but is, surely it's a bit like... Um, trainee doctors or vets or things like that or any profession really yeah. but you start you start levels don't you yeah, you yeah. learn theory then you have a, like a practice exactly and you're and under then, supervision and then, you, then you move on to real people real things but yeah. under incredible supervision yeah um, but the the analogy falls down there because you don't have a volunteer doctor no but you do have <laughs> student doctors you do have student doctors so if you're just going with the student side of things I can understand that's one side of it it's the volunteer thing Mm-hmm. The idea that a volunteer cannot possibly excavate a site efficiently. So it's about training. It's training and supervision, Yeah, I think is it. So um, that's just to talk about the context of that thread and uh-huh. where all of this came from. Okay. Interesting. So let's have a look at this question specifically. Mm-hmm. It says that, uh, will archaeologists be replaced uh, by volunteers or is that... Um, the inference, at least. I think so, yeah. So, upskilling volunteers, employers no longer value archaeology skills due to the high supply. Right. So, talking about the UK context, there is a shortfall of archaeologists by about five to 7,000 individuals if, in the UK, right? If you are talking just... That, that, and that's reporting with regards commercial archaeologists, people who work on building sites, big infrastructure jobs like Crossrail and HS2 and things like that. We do not have enough archaeologists for those sites. Mm-hmm. Now, you cannot replace most of that shortfall with volunteers for one incredibly good reason. They're on building sites and commercial sites who will not allow volunteers on to dig. You have to have a professional card, a CSCS card, which has to be linked to being a professional person. They've just changed it, and I had to prove that I'd passed a relevant uh, archaeological uh, degree to be allowed to apply for my skills card okay. to get onto site. So considering that's 95% of the UK industry there in archaeology, volunteers cannot replace archaeologists because they do not have the professional qualifications that will allow them past the health and safety onto commercial oh, excavations. Interesting. Okay. So the value of an archaeologist should still remain. Now, the reason people have an issue with regards pay, or the perceived impact of volunteers on pay, I think, and this is my opinion, is not based on a devaluing of the skills, but the nature of the industry up until this point, which has been since the creation of commercial archaeologists in the early 90s, the commercial units have been undercutting each other in an attempt to win contracts. 
So there's something bigger going on there. Yes. So I think there's something much bigger going on there, which is that the low pay is... Low pay is created by the fact that it was, um, up until now, an incredibly desirable job. For... So here's all of the things that I think are interplaying with this, <laughs> right? The time team effect. The number of people taking archaeological careers in the UK jumped up because the uh, perception of it as an interesting career and a potential career path was uh, uh, given a boost by the fact that it was so visible Mm -hmm. on television. Right? It was prime time. It was sit down with your family. It was millions of viewers. Right? Yeah. And of those viewers, people went in and they applied to archaeology departments. My intake was around about 100 students at my uh, department when I went in. And that was even then starting to be at the back tail, tail end of things. They, they had huge numbers of students each year going in, which meant that there was a surplus of individuals at the end of it going into archaeology. So you've got a huge pool of people who want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, And archaeology firms trying to undercut each other to win the contracts. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to go in with the lowest price. The easiest way that they can have the lowest price is to pay low wages. But the sheer number of people who are wanting to work in the industry means that there's always someone who will do the job. Yeah. Supply and demand. Supply and demand. What we're starting to see now is a change in the way that funding occurs for universities. People are having to pay a huge amount uh, up front. They're getting big student debts because they've... When I went to university, my student loan was about nine, ten grand. It's now up to, what, 30, 40? Something like that. Lots. Some people... Lots. <laughs> lots and lots. So people are looking for value for money in their degrees. Traditionally, archaeology is an incredibly low-paid industry. So someone just looking at the the wages that you can get out the other end... It doesn't seem worth it. It doesn't seem yeah, worthwhile. It doesn't marry up. It doesn't marry up. So now what you get is you've got a reduced number of people entering archaeology courses in the first place. About half as many on my course came in uh, in the last intake. That's quite substantial. And of those who are actually gone into the degree course the number entering commercial archaeology there was one year i believe i'm right in saying where it was either one or no people at the end of the year were when asked are you going to go into a career in archaeology responded yeah well actually did yeah oh wow so they used it for other things for other things because it is it's one of those ones where it does have transferable skills it's a it's a good degree to give you a basis in a lot of different things Mm -hmm. and it it is it's a it's a a good way of getting into lots of stuff turns out a lot of people are viewing it more that way Mm. as a basis of getting into something else than going into commercial archaeology Mm. okay okay uh In that instance, what we're seeing now is this shortfall that can't be backfilled with volunteers because of the requirements of the industry that it's in. And so now we're starting to see the first pushback on pay because the employers don't necessarily have this pool of staff that they can turn to to pay the low wages. They have to start being aware that, you know, the money has to come up if they want to attract people into the industry. Mm. So that's the first point. Volunteers in commercial archaeology are not devaluing the skills. The low pay was based on, I think, other economic factors. And is at a point now which should start changing if people are proactive and start, you know, Realizing that the power lies in the yeah, so the, workforce the, the sort of market forces have, have changed, changed, and yeah, the balance yes. will start to shift. Exactly, perhaps. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the other side of things is more wide scale research. So not commercial archaeology. Not commercial archaeology, but um, things like Citizen or uh, Past Explorers, which was a very successful volunteer program linked to the Portable Antiquities Scheme, um, run in conjunction with the British Museum. And what that was, was um, you have a huge amount of data entry and recording that 
no one commercially is paying for. Mm -hmm. Basically, at the end of this, is you've got to say, where's the money coming from? Who's paying for this? If you are a professional archaeologist, you deserve to be reimbursed for the skills that you have, but who's paying for it? Mm -hmm. Where's the budget coming from? Yeah. And in those instances, with big, like massive uh, research things like that, volunteers provide most of the uh, the workforce because there's no money anywhere else necessarily to pay for anything other than the supervision levels. So the way that those are organised is you have a professional, a group of professional organisers, and the volunteers provide most of the um, the time mm. into it. Uh, Past Explorers, for example, was um, people going out and sort of like metal detectorists and uh, volunteers at local organisations either recording small finds in sort of like field walking or metal detecting and then putting, inputting those into a database in a way that would be useful for researchers to um, access the data. And it was, it was stuff like there's now, because of the sheer number of volunteers, and we're talking about 500 people over five years, mm -hmm. which for a volunteer project is huge. Mm -hmm. um, it has inputted just Roman coins, 300,000 Roman coin finds across the UK. I think it was 300,000? Yeah, 300,000 Roman coin finds over the UK. That is a cool. huge data set. Yeah. How many professional archaeologists do you think you could pay to put in the same amount of time? Like, what would you think the cost would be? Astronomical. Astronomical. It would be huge. And it wouldn't... The scale of what you get out of it and what you put into it, there's no one who's going to look at that and say, oh, this well, is the... That's value for this money. This is value for money. Yeah. Right. However, just to throw my... Yeah thoughts into this and, yeah. and declare my bias as well I suppose is that I come from a not-for-profit background mm. and I work with volunteers but in a different context so not 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 historical or archaeological archaeological but there is the perception that volunteers come for free <laughs> yeah like, that they're the cheaper option um which I suppose compared to, to employing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds mm. of archaeologists, archaeologists yes of course but there is the still the need for, like you say, the training and supervision element of it, and that takes time and money, and it's where that time and money comes from yeah. as well, um, which needs to be factored yeah, yeah. in. Yeah, and volunteer expenses and things like that, yeah, yeah. Um, in which kind of plays into Tristan's <laughs> second part of his of his question, actually, yeah. um, which is, should the job market rely on volunteering experience when that requires you have money in the first place so that's what i was saying before is that a lot of volunteers come from similar backgrounds but it i think it behoves uh people in the positions of organizing to create volunteering opportunities that are more accessible uh -huh. like it has to be at the design phase that you're thinking am i just going to end up with 40 retired barristers <laughs> <laughs> who are just doing this because, doing this because I've got nothing else yeah. really on, right? Yeah. And they are going to be superb, detail-oriented, yeah. you know. If you just want to have data entry, 40 retired barristers are the, guy, <laughs> the way to go, right? But if you want to do it as more of a kind of a research thing or um, if you want to... It's a really good way... So. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, uh, Carenza uh, from Time Team, uh -huh. Professor, Professor Carenza, uh, was involved in, or Time Team was involved in this idea of uh, digging one metre square test pits in various places uh, around a community, get the community to dig it. And the first bunch of these projects, and it was really interesting, uh, it was a great way of doing spot finds, working out how the particular villages that they were doing it in developed but there's the hit right they were doing it villages at first and these villages had active community groups and you know it was it was basically the same people who were organizing the um the fairs the village fairs. Village fairs. <laughs> yeah. and it was it was really good it was a really cross it was a brilliant project it was a cross um 
the whole community. But I think what they were talking about, or in the lecture I watched her talking about it, the point for me when it started getting really interesting was when they took the same uh, sort of project plan and transported it into a, um, a council estate, essentially, uh, to try and understand the development of that. And it was only briefly covered in, in the lecture the, because I think they'd only done a few trenches. It hadn't had the same sort of like year in, year out res, return, the same density. So it wasn't like something you can build a whole lecture around. But for me, it started to get really interesting because it was in communities that are less traditionally accessed or um, engaged, engaged with, with by yeah. heritage industries. And the way it was just something that she said in passing was as soon as you start digging a hole in the middle of the the green space, people come out and go, what are you doing? Yeah. And when you go, we're doing an archaeological thing, they go, oh, can I have a go? Right? Yeah. And that's not that, um, it's not like this sort of condescending thing of like, even they want to do it. It's the fact that they went into that community, which isn't something people always do with archaeology. Yeah. And like everyone else in the world, they went, oh, Ooh. this is close to me. It's not costing me too much to get there. It's an opportunity to do something interesting. Yeah. And it was, I, I, th I genuinely think it was more of a, a, a resource thing because it was there. People were like, oh, thank you for bringing something here. This is interesting. Let's yeah. have a go at it. Right. And that's what I mean. It's then... <laughs> I don't think volunteers are... So he says, are they integral to the work? No, so the, the, Tristan's question was, should the job market rely on volunteering experience? Should so the job market rely on volunteering experience? Oh, when, so that, like, when that requires you to have money in the first place. So when place. people are, are getting into the job market, should they have volunteering experience in, the, uh, in their background, in their CV? Oh, I see what you mean. I didn't read it like that, but that's uh, also a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then I think it's a case of... I can understand why that's more of a, a, a trying to uh, use that as a uh, a way of indicating that someone has uh, just an understanding of what's going to be going on. Um, but it shouldn't be the only thing that identifies people. Because the, yeah, because the opportunities may not, not exist in their communities to do that. No, so it should You're be right, yeah. exactly. So it should there should be more ways into the job market. Um, things that are starting to develop, like uh, what's it called, apprenticeships, so that you know the access is given with some support, mm -hmm. um, so other grants, yeah. and the volunteering experience that people are getting need to be designed. In a way that they that people who don't necessarily have the money can still access them. Mm -hmm. I suppose as well. Is there a slight difference between volunteer or what people traditionally think as volunteering and just community involvement? So, for example, with the Citizen mm. Project, you can show incredible interest yeah. in in that area, but is not probably is it defined as a, a, a volunteering opportunity? I mean, it should be. People are volunteering their time. You, you, it should be kept on the same level. I think any community engagement should be considered, you know, well, not any. There's some that are passive, aren't there, like going to a lecture. But anything where you've gone out and, and, and done something yeah. to aid in the understanding or recording of a site is, to my mind, a volunteering yeah. position. So perhaps it's around recognition of those sorts of things yeah. as well. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's it's a tricky one because it, it, you know, it, it sort of gets into the demographics of archaeology. And in the UK, I'd say it's getting better more recently, but it's it definitely needs, it needs more people from different backgrounds in it. It always does. Everything does. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, like, it's not just not just archaeology. That's the whole. I mean, basically, what we're saying is we need to fix everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking as a tall, white, straight man, <laughs> I don't know if I'm the one to fix it. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um. Okay, though. But here's an interesting question that ties in with that. <laughs> um, so this is from James Green 
underscore archaeology redux. Oh, we have to do it again. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so he asks, as an archaeologist, mm. do you feel it's a professional obligation to occasionally volunteer time to speak to the public about archaeology? Yes. So do you volunteer? Do I volunteer? <laughs> yes. Yes. I have been out and done talks for free because... Number one. Uh, you're doing it right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess this is voluntary. That's a really good way to point that out. <laughs> I, I actually pay money to do this. I have to, I have to host it. Oh, wow. Wow, that was an incredible miss on my part. <laughs> I can't think of any examples right now of me ever speaking about um, archaeology for free. Which reminds me, we should definitely get a sponsor. Yeah, feel free. <laughs> if you'd like to do a voluntary subscription. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to the bugle too I much. Know, sorry. <laughs> that the, the ruthless. Oh yeah. By the way, the uh, here's here's another one for the random plug of uh, podcasts that aren't about archaeology and <laughs> don't benefit me in any way. But if you don't already listen to the bugle, it's really fun. <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, there, there you go. I think it's incredibly important. Um, I, yeah, I, I regularly go out and do, uh, I do comedy shows about archaeology for no money because I like to sneak, uh, learning in with humour. I do, uh, lectures for the same thing. In fact, I'm doing one in Southwark about, uh, the archaeology of performance spaces in London. Ooh. I know, right? Um, uh, and when I've written it, that'd be even better. <laughs> um, and I do the podcast. So, yeah, I definitely, I think I, pra- I practice what I preach. Um, and the reason is twofold. One, I think it's an important uh, subject for people to understand. I think people's... Uh, I th- I, I, I think having the context of understanding where we came from and how we got here is a really important grounding position in understanding your place in the world. Deep. Yeah. <laughs> well, 1.5 metres and then step in. <laughs> um, and I think the other reason is that I really, really enjoy talking to people about things that interest me and that interest them. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So... Then we have a question from Son of Gav. Hello. And they ask, what is the best thing a volunteer has done for you or someone else on a site you've been working on? Oh, well, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Interesting question. Oh, the best. I mean, oh, I, I mean, I could go down the kind of like, Everything they do is the best. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Every moment that they spend with us is an, a gift. <laughs> uh, specifically, that's a, it's it's quite a tricky one because the things that people do. I, oh God! I am going to go down the line of like everything's really everything's really good. I can't pick out one. Do you know what's bad though? I can definitely pick out the worst. Oh, do that! Do that. <laughs> I wrote a play. Um... <laughs> I'm saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the best. Um, I, I, there has to be one person who stands out. I don't know it. it it just surprises you all the time, like people, the lengths people go to, that because they're just interested in it. Like you'll you'll say, "Oh, can you, you know, can you have a look at this?" And the next thing you know, they've you've got a twenty-page report because they had the time and they got into it, yeah. and you know, all of a sudden, they they're just happy to be in, involved in it and all that sort of stuff. So, so people often go above and beyond. Yeah, yeah, it's. It's getting hold of people who are passionate about something, and you you must have seen this in your thing as well. Whenever Absolutely. you've had volunteers, yeah. so it's trying to get them to stop. Oh my god! Yeah. Yes, right. <laughs> so we did some digitizing of burial records, right? And we we got to the end of the. It was a trial run thing, okay? And we got to the end of the project, and one of the volunteers said, "Do you mind if I just keep going?" All right? And I said, "Fine." 
whatever. And it's now a year and a half and they have <laughs> not stopped. And I can't stop them. I think it's like, I think I've gone into a kind of, um, what's it called? Fantasia situation. And I can't <laughs> stop the brooms from working. <laughs> but it's great. Because every couple of months, just ping! I've done all of this. Like, lovely. Thank you. Why are you still going? <laughs> you can't stop. stop. They're going to do the whole library, I think, because they just... Because they, they want to. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. I think that's all our questions about volunteering. Okay. I'm just checking. Sorry. Yeah. Check it away. You can cut this bit out. <laughs> I'm trying not to. <laughs> trying to avoid editing today. It's too sunny outside. I just want to go outside. And I want to get back to the cricket. Okay. <laughs> so, we will, uh, I think, yeah, finish on Brian Lee's question. Mm-hmm. Um, Brian has two questions for you. Um, and these are, if, <laughs> if I wanted to ensure my body gets dug up by an archaeologist in a thousand to two thousand years... So that my DNA can be used to create clones of myself to populate a theme park, naturally. Naturally. <laughs> What's the best strategy? Oh, okay. Um, well, first of all, you're going to have to pres- uh, you have to preserve your DNA. So I don't know. Put your teeth in a nice. Get your teeth pulled out <laughs> and put into a like a sealed box. So it protects the roots. What kind of box would be best? Oh, airtight. <laughs> airtight, but like clear plastic. Like clear plastic, maybe. And with a really strong seal. So the people are, are like... Yeah, why clear? So that you can see that it's You've got a box, box of, of teeth. teeth. <laughs> yeah, make it easy for them. Come on. Okay, okay. And then like have, um, I'd say, in slate... Uh, carve a little message saying hello to formal obviously hello, hello. <laughs> yep a um, recording perhaps yeah yeah yep. i've kept these <laughs> nice for you please feel free to use my dna <laughs> like a note a note to anyone who's digging you up okay um and just uh, also on that slate uh put just any ailments that you've had during life <laughs> Uh, anytime you've broken anything, just like really make it because some real in, some notes. Yes, yeah, so this is making it very easy what, for. Uh, yeah, I know. Yes, and he's saying, "How do I want to? You know, what's the best strategy? You make it so that they they want to help you get cloned, right? Okay, okay. So that you turn up and they're like, "What a lovely bloke!" Okay, and it lets them test theories of you know what you can learn from bones. If you're like, "I broke my right leg," and they're like, "You did break your right leg." <laughs> Make it easy for him. Ingratiate yourself. Okay. (laughs) Write a a little biography about how you were a lovely person in life, and if you clone me now, I promise I won't be a new dictator, right? (laughs) Just a couple of photographs that have been carved into the stone as well with a laser. Oh, wow, like cave drawings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really make a real... uh, And then you're going to have to get buried somewhere... Yeah, they've got to find you. High up. Okay. Above the potential rise in sea levels. Right, strong. Yeah. In... What kind of earth is uh, best? Clay. A wetter clay. Or if you're able to have a um, a coffin. That... See, right. You want a coffin that preserves the bones really well, but has a hole to let the juices out. Ooh. I know, right? Grim. Okay. Because... You melt. Nobody. Like, <laughs> lead coffin people. It's kind of like... You have ruined my day, lead coffin person. <laughs> oh, that's so grim. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, something that is, like, okay. n- neutral material. Like what? I don't know, just nothing acidic or alkaline. Okay. Or something that can handle the soil around it as well. And it can kind of maintain a good void for you to hang out in. <laughs> uh, and I guess... Hmm, it's tricky. Yeah, you want to keep it so that the uh, you want you want to be in a location that now this is the really tricky bit. You want to predict future developments in infrastructure. So that they have to about a thousand years ahead of it. 
Or can you organise for like a letter to be sent? A thousand. Oh years yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to do it like as a random fine. Oh, not okay. As a, not <laughs> not uh, we're not we're not on uh, what's it called? Um, Back to the Future rules. <laughs> my, my, McFly, this letter's been here a thousand years. Dig me up and clone me. Um, um, but well, yeah. Also, I suspect some suggestions for theme park names. <laughs> great on that piece of slate as well uh, yeah <laughs> just, uh, what's his name Brian 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 Lund <laughs> just lots of Brian's oh my goodness <laughs> great Brian <laughs> that's terrible that's awful yeah. <laughs> um, suggestions for next week's podcast please <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so okay, that's good. That's the important question answered. Yeah. Then I yeah, hope yeah. that I, I hope that helps. I think you, that's Brian. important. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, his second question. Mm-hmm. So he asks, "What is the most beautiful site you've ever worked in?" He says, "I'd ask about the ugliest, but I imagine any clay trench during a rainstorm gets Ooh, pretty bad." Yeah, that's pretty bad. He Not also even. says hello to us. Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> Very formal. Um, well, ugliest I could definitely do. What's uh, that? Uh, some of the it got pretty grim on the Olympics every now and again. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because it was just it was uh, post-industrial wastelands. Mm. Yeah, yeah, with trenches filled with landfill. Um, looks really nice now. I'm genuinely surprised. When I went to go and see it at the Olympics, I, like, I, I, I was like, how? How have they done this? Also, how have none of the athletes developed extra legs? Because <laughs> I know what was underground. Um, most beautiful was Bwerere near Umbrara in Uganda. Absolutely stunning. Just oof, like words don't uh, come close. That's not great for a podcast. I know. <laughs> But it was just standing watching this valley under uh, uh, as the sun was coming up, and you could just watch the sun creeping out over it all. And the colours were magnificent. We were just at the beginning of the rainy season, so everything was coming out nice and green, and vibrant. And yeah, it was just it was um, it was a, a it was one of those ones where you get to take a moment and go, well. My well, life's not too bad, is it? <laughs> so that was more about the site in general, or the location of the site. Yeah, yeah. The not a particularly gorgeous trench. <laughs> yeah, no, there wasn't a particularly... There's not one that's like a real like, humdinger. I mean, there was one. <laughs> there was one off Fleet Street. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, it was sort of... Look at... Look at the look at the stratigraphy. It was actually the stratigraphy. It was a really good section. <laughs> Sharp! Uh... And, but it was one of those ones that you get in central London where it has the three black lines. What's that? It's where you can see the th- uh, three major destructions of London. Ooh. Yes. What, like the fire? The, the... Boudican destruction, uh-huh. uh, when she burned it down, so the Roman city gone. Uh-huh. Uh, Great Fire of London, and the Blitz. Wow. Yeah, you can see the three lines all the way up the street. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those where cool. you clean it up and you're like... Ah, oh, there's London. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, good answer. Thank you. I hope that's uh, answered Brian's question too. I do too. Um, that is all the questions for today. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Um, thank you everyone who sent in. There were so many really interesting ones. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, podcast. I would like to say a very formal thank you <laughs> Bye. to Laura uh, for asking the questions. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I will now free you to check your cr- cr- cricket I know, scores. I know. What is the cricket that. score? Let's date know. this. I don't know. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Carry England on. England versus India one day. Oh my goodness. Look at the. T- she's so tense. How are we doing? It is currently. Yeah. 253 for three. 253 for three. Not <gasps> bad. With nine overs left to go. Oh, very good indeed. Um, <laughs> so I'll leave you to look. <laughs> I hope uh, that's not a spoiler. No, it can't be, can it? By the time this comes up. No. 
past. Literally in the past, also. But I we, like that we're we, date stamping it. Yeah, yeah, but so. there was like 20 seconds there we were like, oh, is the score coming? Is it coming? Is it? And people were listening through that and were still like, oh! <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's asked an archaeologist. Until next time. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Holden McGarrity. The music you were listening to was by From the Ashes. Check them out on Bandcamp. It was produced by me, Holden McGarrity. You can follow me on Twitter at Ask an Arc, or you can send an email at askanarch at gmail.com. But most importantly, if you've enjoyed yourself and you think you have a friend who might be interested in the podcast, please tell them about it. Write a review, put up a star rating, let people know that we're here. It's incredibly helpful and much appreciated. Once again, thank you to everyone who has asked an arc. Bye-bye. <laughs>